Right. So next talk, it's uh, by Bjorn von Gandas from the University of Bergen. And the title is again on the screen, Applications of Topological Cyclic Homology in Algebraic K-Theory. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot. And thanks for having me here and happy birthday to cyclic homology. Uh, I was asked to give a presentation and um, present an overview of topological cyclic homology from a historical perspective, uh, which means that I'll try to, to actually do that. And I'll not go very much into details, but I have tried to, uh, try to give an overview so that uh, if you're not familiar with the topic, you can find uh, certain papers that you can start nesting from and then find what you actually are interested in. But that means that um, I have selected papers to start with that perhaps can be good to, to go from and not necessarily the greatest papers that are around. So there is some arbitrary, uh, arbitrariness in what I've done here. So I'll start with prehistory, then go to cyclic homology, and then we'll start with exactly what uh, Khan was uh, talking about earlier today, that the integers is not a good enough starting point. We need to go back to the sphere spectrum. So let's just start and see where this brings us, and we will spread out after we have gotten to the main actors, namely, topological cyclic homology. But let's have some prehistory first. I tried to get some pictures of people. I haven't gotten a picture of everyone, but Gerson I got a picture of, I hope. I don't know him, so I hope that's Gerson. And so in, well, from the very beginning of algebraic K theory, so this is the time when Quill defines what we call algebraic K theory now. Uh, Gersten defines a map from the K-theory groups to the Kähler differentials that he calls the D-log map. And um, well, it comes along with the churn characters that are, of course, much older, uh, but it's reasonable to call it the D-log map because when you restrict to the units inside K1 and then move to the Kähler differentials, then it's exactly sends a unit G to one over G, DG. So that is the D log map, but it extends to all dimensions. And then in the very same proceedings as Quill gives his um, definition of higher algebraic K theory and all his guises with the Q constructions and whatnot, Bloch has <clears throat> a very interesting little paper where he defines the tangent space of algebraic K theory as simply the K theory of the dual numbers modulo the K theory of the ground ring. And he observes that when A is local ring with one half, commutative of course, then actually the Kähler differentials split off that tangent space. And you should notice here that uh, there's a little shift in dimension here of the Kähler differentials. It's not, so the D log map preserved uh, the, um, the degree, but this thing that splits off is one off here. We will come back to that later, uh, but uh, it's a very good thing to remember when we go further. Um, of course, Dennis, Keith Dennis defines his trace map and this is in the middle of a lot of development. One is exploring the, the connections between algebraic K theory and crystalline cohomology and algebraic cycles and whatnot. But this is, uh, this is in a slightly different direction, it seems at the time. Then as a warning of things to come, uh, Waldhausen, I don't know whether 78 is quite right, but it shouldn't be too far off the mark. Uh, he observes, okay, so where does, where does Friedhelm Waldhausen come from here? He is interested in manifolds. That's why he at all considers algebraic K theory. And he defines this algebraic K theory of spaces, which we now would just think of as algebraic K theory of spherical group rings. And he observes that Dennis trace map actually factors 
through a, a universal homology theory. A homology theory that is as close as possible to algebraic K theory. And as a matter of fact, for the cases he is interested in, for spherical group rings or for the sphere spectrum itself, it splits off. It is what he calls the mystery homology theory. And he also speculates that uh, this distance shouldn't be too far. So in a certain sense, the homology theory closest to algebraic K theory should perhaps be something like partial homology. Okay, so crucial to uh, Waldhausen's observations here is that the difference between the sphere spectrum, which we'll talk much about later, and the integers, that vanishes rationally. So rationally, they're just the same thing. So if you want to have rational information about the algebraic K theory of spaces, then uh, probably uh, this is a good invariant. But there's a lot of torsion information that is lost. Oh, all of the hom stable homotopy groups of sphere, of course, lost when you go to the integers. So uh, there is much geometry that we are definitely trying to have, but uh, which is lost when we go down with the rationalization and uh, Hochschild homology. So the question perhaps is what should Hochschild homology of spherical group rings be like? And um, eventually Waldhausen and Goodwillie conjecture that there ought to be a Hochschild homology over the sphere instead of over the integers. They call it topological Hochschild homology. And uh, so the integers should be replaced by the sphere spectrum and the tensor product should be re uh, replaced by the smash, which is just tensoring over the sphere spectrum as we see it now. And this homology, this mystery homology theory should simply be this topological Hochschild homology on the nose. Okay, but of course there's more to this story because there's much more geometry behind it uh, in the other sense. And that is, um, we definitely do want to have a geometric homolo homology theory, something that is akin to say, uh, Durham homology or something like that. And from this perspective, Kahn comes God sent with, uh, with his cyclic homology, which of course he, as far as I understand, he invents for very different purposes, but uh, it fits very nicely into the story that I'm trying to, to paint now or tell now. And uh, so I'll stick to that part of the story even though it's perhaps not historically quite correct. So the main question uh, that uh, is uh, asked now is what is the relation to algebraic K theory? And uh, of course, is there a churn character, a D log, something like that? Things happen very quickly at this stage. Uh, how does it compare with Bloch's tang tangent space idea? And how does it compare with Waldhausen's setup? Approximately the same time, Ziegen and Fagan also have a theory, as far as you understand, independently these were developed. And um, they call it additive K theory. And um, their perspective is, is quite geometric in the sense that perhaps you should think of K theory, well, that's built out of the group, general linear group. And this additive K theory, which is then turns out to be the same as Kant's cyclic homology, is built out of the general linear Lie algebra. And so one could think the connection between K theory and cyclic homology in this context as being something like the local homeomorphism between the Lie group and its tangent space. So lots of things happen at this, uh, at this stage. There are so many things that are going on at the same time. Uh, of course, I must admit that I learned these things mostly from Kavogi's asterisk note. And um, well, on the other hand, I remember also when in Berkeley buying Menin's uh, Springer notes, lecture notes, where Fagan and Siegen's paper was in. And it was, I think that was the first that I got paid 
somebody else paid for me buying. But we shouldn't completely forget um, algebraic K theory of spaces, because that somehow moves in parallel with the theory. So Kahn invents uh, cyclic homology, Fagan and Siegen develop algebraic K theory, uh, uh, additive K theory. But um, for instance, Siang and Staffold, they struggle with understanding the rational part of algebraic K theory of spaces or of spherical group rings. And they develop a theory that is in many ways very, very similar. And there are large parallels between what all of these people are doing. So it must have been an exciting time. I, I must admit that this time I was in high school. So I didn't, I, I didn't participate. So I don't know really what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah. Lots of things going on, many calculations. Actually, I had a list of calculations I wanted to, to talk about, but then I realized that that would take forever. There are so many nice rational cal calculations that happen. And also I could find so few of the pictures of the people I wanted to talk about. So um, I go directly to the precursor of the connection between topological cyclic homology and algebraic K theory in the rational case, uh, that is Goodwill's result, which is twofold. There, there are two papers, but um, one paper essentially says that this homology theory that is closest to algebraic K theory, what Waldhausen called stable uh, K theory, is rationally the same as Hochschel homology. And he also proves that locally, or rather for nilpotent extensions, K-theory and cyclic homology are actually the same, but of course there should be a shift in, uh, shift in degree there. So I should put a suspension there. And I'm influenced, I guess, by, uh, by Weibel's writing here, but I, all of the time when I think of this, and probably this makes sense to uh, both Kahn and Siegen, who are here, and Carol Lee, uh, is that we think of this relative result as a logarithm. It goes from the general linear group to the general linear Lie algebra, and you have the, uh, well, you have the sequence or the, the series for a logarithm one plus x plus x square half, and so forth. And because things are nilpotent, x to the big power is zero. So obviously the, the sequence converge, or the series converge. And since we're rational, we can divide out by all these numbers. So yay, we have a function and yay, it is an equivalence. So, and, and this of course was very much, uh, there very many people were thinking about these things and very many partial results were at the table at the time. Um, there was one important observation, and, it, uh, and I guess uh, Goodwillie's uh, result, second result hinges crucially on it. And that is the observation, I think is due to Hood, Jones, and Goodwillie, that um, the McDennis trace map from algebraic K theory to topological, uh, to Hochschild homology, this is the Dennis trace. It factors not over cyclic homology. Okay, so Kahn discovered cyclic homology and saw that it had to do with the action of the circle on Hochschild homology. And uh, the cyclic homology that is defined is then the homotopy orbits of that action. Uh, but uh, Hood, Jones, and Goodwillie realize that, well, that's not actually where the Dennis trace maps it maps to the homotopy fixed points rather than to the homotopy orbits. So it's much more of a divided power-like thing. Um, but things are not so bad. So how can this possibly be true then? Well, that is because actually the fixed points and the orbits coincide in the relative nilpotent situation. Of course, with uh, you have to suspend once in order to make sense of that. And that is because the, 
the corresponding take or periodic uh, theory vanishes uh, at uh, for these relative nilpotent situations. So that's how this map in the equivalence there is realized. Okay, but then I come to uh, come to my um, my task here. I should talk about topological cyclic homology and not topological uh, and not only cyclic homology because uh, the re realization here is rationally is not good enough. There is a lot of torsion information about K theory that we do want to uh, to preserve. And um, working in Bielefeld at the time, Marcel Buxtet. Um, does actually discover this topological Hochschild homology, this Hochschild homology that is defined over the sphere spectrum. And uh, well, he does some calculation and he finds that it actually exactly fits the expectations of Goodwillian and Waldhausen. And uh, then immediately, so, so we see here a good thing. We see here a good thing, we have torsion information we have the sphere spectrum. We have an enhancement of the Dennis trace. We do want to know something about algebraic K theory of group rings. And so um, Shang, Bergstedt, and Mazen immediately try to solve the Novikov conjecture. The algebraic Novikov conjecture has to do with a so called assembly map. And the assembly map, what is it? Okay, so uh, K theory is built out of matrices. So you have a matrix with uh, uh, entries in the ring R and you have a group element and you can just multiply that group element into every place in the, in the matrix and you get a matrix over the um, group ring RG. So basically that's all you need to know of the assembly map. And in certain situations, this assembly is an equivalence. Uh, for instance, if G is um, uh, G is three, it's an equivalence. But mm, it's important to know how close it is to an equivalence for much more general spaces. And we have been talking about things that are quite close to that earlier today. And so, Bergstedt, Shang, and Matson kickstart the entire theory by trying to prove and actually proving the Novikov conjecture for a uh, uh, for certain uh, groups, those groups are the groups with finite homology in all dimensions. And what they prove then is that rationally, the map from uh, the assembly map is rationally a, um, an injection. And how do they do that? Well, they invent this theory TC. And they invent a trace map from K theory to TC. They want to show that this map here is rationally injective. So they have to show that this composite here, if they can do that, the composite here is rationally injective, then they are in business. And how do they do that? Okay, so, so these are people who know their equivariant uh, stable homotopy theory. So they look at uh, they look at Bergstedt's topological Hochschild homology, and they recognize certain structures that they have seen before in stable uh, equivariant stable homotopy theory. And in particular, we are interested in the spherical group ring case, and there this structure is very transparent. So for the spherical group ring case. Topological Hochschild homology is nothing but the free loop space. The free loop space, so all the maps from the circle to the classifying space of the group. And there, of course, you can act by speeding up the rotation. You can use the power map. So if, uh, if the map from the circle to itself, viewing that as complex numbers of length one, you can then take little z, the point, point little c to z to the nth or something like that. And you have various interplay between, between these maps. And they play nicely with the equivariant structure. And since k theory of the spherical group ring, which is interesting from 
um, Malthouser perspective and the integral grouping are rationally the same, if you want to know something about integral groupings and you have such a picture here, well, you can replace integral group rings by spherical group rings, and you can use your awesome information about spherical group ring and then topological cyclic homology of spherical, spherical group rings. I'll come back to a wee bit of the inner workings of topological cyclic homology as we go along. But so, but these guys here were on a mission. They wanted to show the Novikov conjecture, and they just invented this thing to do that. Because they could. Okay. So, um, so this spawns instant enthusiasm. And already at the ICM in Kyoto in 1990, Goodwillie conjectures that um, his theorem, his rational theorem, is totally fine integrally if you just replay, replace uh, this um, Hochschild homology, this fix, these fixed points of Hochschild homology with his TC. Yay. Okay, brave. So rationally, he knew it was true. Yeah, it should be true integrally if we just replace uh, the sphere spectrum if we just replace the integers by the sphere spectrum and use topological cyclic homology instead of Hochschild homology. And his vision is, well, from his point of view, it's quite natural. What he says is that, well, K theory is an analytic functor. Think of an analytic function. TC is an analytic function. And uh, well, when are two analytic functions locally, uh, the dis uh, difference locally constant? Well, if they have the same differentials. So he conjectures that, well, this will then be the Waldhausen stable K theory, that ought to be THH. And the same should be true for topological cyclic homology. So you have a map of um, analytic functors that induces an isomorphism on all the differentials, and so you should have within a radius of convergence that the difference between algebraic K theory and topological cyclic homology should be constant. Yeah. Okay, that's not the only thing that's happening at the time. Of course, uh, Bergsted and Matson see that they have something awesome on their hands. So what do they do? They start out to do the most prestigious calculation immediately. They don't stop doing something easy. They do something hard. They try to calculate topological cyclic homology of the integers, and they actually succeed. And what the reason I am such an awe for this is that the strategy that they employ is the strategy that next to all calculations that later on have followed. So it's hard to, those two part, papers are hard to read, but they're, they're, they include so much cool stuff. So what is their general outline of how they do it? First, they calculate topological Hochschild homology, but that was easy because Buxted had already done that. And then I lie because I, okay, so this is not quite historically correct, but I bet these guys were thinking these, this way, even though they didn't write it quite like that. So it turns out that um, there are fiber sequences that connect fixed points, low, uh, low fixed points are with high fixed points. So you can go from small groups to high groups via fiber sequences. And these are actual fixed points. So that's uh, sort of strange and hard to, uh, to deal with, but you can com always compare with the homotopy uh, fixed points, those you can calculate by means of spectral sequences. And uh, it then turns out that the fixed points, the actual fixed point, are fit in a fiber, uh, fiber square uh, with uh, fixed points of a smaller group, the so-called Tate, which has to do with Tate homology, and the homotopy fixed points. And um, this was made into an important tool uh, later on and was the focal point of uh, several uh, others. 
Uh, and also, um, when we come to Nikolaus and Schultz's perspective, this thing that you can actually realize the fixed points by means of a pullback of homotopy sensible things is an important one. Uh, Heslot and Mazen later uh, make this into a central theme of theirs, having the cyclotomic structure of topological Hochschild homology. Okay, then they prove that this map here is an equivalence. So this map here is an equivalence that uses crucially an insight by Salidis, whose picture I couldn't find. Um, so they have that actually the actual fixed points can be calculated by means of the homotopy fixed points. And the homotopy fixed points that those are, well, those are calculated by standard homological machines, fixed and Tate spectral sequence, multiplicative structure, just like you would calculate negative cyclic homology using a bicomplex. These things pop out of exactly the same structure. And then you assemble all the information you have, you take all these so-called restriction maps and you get something very bit theory-like, or you can go up via the, what's called the Frobenius maps, which actually just assemble to uh, the homotopy fixed points. So that's the inclusion of homotopy fixed points one after another. And the important thing is that they observe that the Lichten von Quillen conjecture uh, holds in, these ca in this case. So that la later spawns redshift phenomena and stuff like that. Let's come back to that later. But of course, uh, John Rognes proves that uh, you can also do this at the prime two, which is a very interesting, uh, there, there are technicalities there that are very, very interesting. I will not talk about that now. Okay, so now we've calculated the topological cyclic homology of the integers, then we want to put that to good use. But then we need to know that Tom Goodwillie's uh, conjecture was true. And together with Randy McCarthy, we prove at least for simplicial rings that Waldhausen's idea that a stable K theory should be THH is true. Waldhausen, of course, knew this for the sphere spectrum. And there, is, uh, there are two things that should be taken along here, which we will use later on, uh, that was necessary here. And the first thing is that THH is Morita invariant. So instead of talking about uh, THH of the ring itself, you can talk about THH of the category of finitely generated projective modules. And um, then on the other hand, K theory is the universal functor splitting exact sequences which is important in later developments, but uh, okay, so one sort, sort of knew that on a non-formal uh, non um, basis, but which was enough to actually say that THH of the finitely generated projective A modules were the same as, well, essentially you could group complete inside THH. And well, that was a brilliant idea. And as soon as you had that, things started running and you could compare very easily to, um, to algebraic K theory. And the Dennis trace map simply was a very, very inclusion, very simple inclusion of the actual fixed points into THH. And lastly, of course, you need to know that in the stable case, the sum is equal to the product. That wouldn't have been worth very much were it not for Heslov just at the same time proving that the same is true for topological cyclic homology. The first differential of topological cyclic homology is also topological Hochschild homology, yay. And so following um, uh, Goodwillist uh, ideas, well, actually uh, McCarthy was able to realize Goodwillist idea and so he proves a good Willis conjecture, at least after P completion and for simplicial rings. And um, then I was lucky enough to prove it after P completion for all rings, simply because um, uh, simplicial rings are dense in, uh, connective, as a, in connective ring spectra. So you have this denseness result. So anything that is continuous, which is true for uh, simplicial rings will automatically be uh, true for connective ring spectra. And immediately afterwards, we knew that it was true integrally. I think we have had insights, the three of us, 
uh, independently. So we knew that this was true, but unfortunately it took forever to write down the proof. But Goodwill's conjecture is true then. You have a connective ring spectra, a map of connective ring spectra, so that it induces a surjection on pi naught with nil potent kernel. Then the difference between K theory of A and K theory of B is the same as the difference between topological cyclic homology of A and topological cyclic homology of B. And that is an integral statement. Goody. So can this, this be used for something? After all, uh, this, uh, this is all about the difference between K theory, differences between K theory of one thing and another thing. It's, they're relative statements, all of this. But then, uh, then, um, Hesselhoff again and Masson enter this scene and do this wonderful, approximately at the same time, wonderful paper here where they do the following decisive step. So the prime field, the prime field was known by Quill. Uh, it was very, very dull. The K theory, the prime field, at least at the prime P, when we complete at the prime P, that is just something in degree zero. It's just K naught is, uh, is the integers and that's it. There's nothing apart from the stuff that is in degree zero. And uh, that is also true for a topological cyclic homology apart from this very irritating thing in degree minus one. So K theory and topological cyclic homology coincide exactly for FP. But then Suslin and Panin, had shown that the K theory of uh, the piadic integers were built up very, very nicely, even at the prime from uh, Z mod P to the nth from this tower here. And so once Heslot and Masson proved the same thing for topological cyclic homology, they can elevate this insight, which was not that deep into this awesome statement. So the K theory of the piadics is at, after P completion, the same as the topological cyclic of the integers. And that Bergsted and Maasen has computed. So yay, wonderful. They have calculated the K theory of the piadic integers. Celebrate. Okay, so the reason I, I make such a fuss of this paper is that it, for one thing, it, it cements and it enhances the innovations of the paper of Bergset and Masen that I was so um, enthusiastic about. And it also highlights the cyclotomic perspective, which later on turns out to be very important. And it also puts a lot of structure on, uh, on the entire theory. Yeah, okay, so I don't have time for, oops, I don't have time for that. Mm. Okay, so this is where we stand then at the turn of the century, the millennium even. We have this wonderful theorem due to a, a late, latest part, well, it's an amalgamation of many uh, statements. If you have a connective ring spectrum, such that pi naught is an algebra over the bit vectors, over a perfect field, I guess. Uh, and it, this pi naught of A probably should be a finitely generated module over the bit vectors as well. Then the difference between K theory and topological cyclic homology, at least after P completion, is just some noise in degree minus one, which has to do with the Frobenius action on the, the bit vectors. So, this is the state of the art around 2000. And of course, then what do we have to do? We have to calculate, we have to calculate, we have to calculate. So number theory, well, this, is, this, this was a start with number theory. We have the piadics should go further. We should investigate the lichtenbach quill conjecture. Of course, since we have this control of nil potent extensions, we should do that. Uh, what about schemes? Should we consider those as well? Spherical group rings, after all, this is how it came about. Algebraic K theory spaces, assembly, redshift, and so forth. 
And, but there's a lot of questions about what the structure is. So how do you do it for schemes? What does localization look like? How do you have excision? And lastly, uh, perhaps we should talk a wee about, about, uh, wee about rigidity, which was so important to go between FP and the theatics. And also there are new perspectives. How, how do you see these things in a modern framework? Yay. Okay, impact on number theory, lichtenbach quill conjecture. The pinnacle, more or less, at least for a while, of all these um, questions were done by Heslot and Masson in their annals paper, um, where they calculate K-theory of local fields. And there they use the calculation, of course, the calculation of scheme of Heslot, uh, Masson, and Bergstedt. They used Goodwillis conjecture, and they use our setup for TC of categories. That is to say, they have this insight that topological cyclic homology is, for instance, if you apply topological cyclic homology to the rationals, it's just nonsense. Topological cyclic homology of the rationals is totally uninteresting. But if you had localization sequences as you have for K-theory, then you should be able to calculate that from K-theory of the ring of integers and from the K-theory of the residue fields. And how does that happen in algebraic K-theory? Well, it's, uh, it's just how you look at the algebraic K-theory of the field of fractions as a localization of the uh, finally generated projective modules over the ring of integers. And if you do that, you actually can, uh, can get your grubby hands on what topological cyclic homology of say the rationals tries to be, even though it fails badly and then you get your hands on algebraic K theory. So that gives a first start to the log methods that come later and localization for, uh, uh, for ring spectra. And has a lot of mass in here, um, essentially they can't go any further. In some sense, you can't go any further because K theory of the integers and K theory of the piatics, they are vastly different, we know that. Uh, K theory of the, uh, uh, integers, well, you probably need some otitic methods or something like that. Well, we know that. In order to get that, this thing here is, uh, you can attack it with topological cyclic homology. But topological cyclic homology can't see the difference, at least after P completion at the outside. So if these things are different, then these things are the same. TC is not the thing to calculate K theory of the integers. That's not just the way you do it. But still, there is ongoing research and you can, at least on the local side, there's lot to be, lots to be said. Okay, I don't think I will talk about this, but obviously low hanging fruit here is that you want to talk, uh, you, you want to calculate trun uh, truncated polynomial algebras. After all, the Goodwillis theorem was all about nilpotent extension. So you, you have an enormous expansion of our uh, knowledge of algebraic K theory just by applying Goodwillis results. And that continues to, to this day with knowing more and more. And sort of a sad story is that uh, K theory group rings, uh, there, there are lots of happened on K theory group rings and, and these three fellows here have been three of the ones responsible for that enormous, uh, those enormous advances. But unfortunately, very few of their advance, advances have actually used cycl the cyclotomic trace. But uh, this thing here, together with the wrongness, so Lick, Reich, Wrongness, and Marisco, uh, do give very interesting information. And of course, wrongness pins down K-theory of the sphere spectrum, at least the homotopy type of it, uh, in uh, an early paper here. So of course, I, I will make these notes available and so that you can check out these um, references if you, there's something that you want to know more about. Algebraic geometry, of course, we need to know what happens say in the smooth case. How do you go from the, uh, go from the um, affine case to 
the global case. And Geisler and Hesselhoff already in 79 at the Seattle uh, conference show how to do that. And there's lots in here that uh, is used in many other places. And very many calculations in this line uh, follow up, but not only calculations, also, so algebraic uh, geometry pays back uh, quite a lot of the structure. This, these are just three examples. I'm sorry for missing so much good stuff here. But uh, algebraic, uh, algebraic geometry is paying back and giving structure and insight to, uh, to the story here. Okay, how am I doing on time? I am not doing so great. <sighs> okay. We must talk a wee bit about k theory of ring spectra. So now we have done a lot of discrete things. We should come back to the k theory of ring spectra. Waldhausen himself thought of uh, going from number theory and adding more and more uh, information and getting to the number theory of the sphere spectrum, more or less, through a tower, a chromatic tower like this, climbing up k theory. So going from number theory to manifolds, essentially. And um, the first paper that, okay, so of course, all of the uh, um, efforts have gone to trying to see the totally algebraic thing, but what happens at the next layer? How do we actually, how much do we see more of, um, uh, of the sphere spectrum? Well, uh, what we saw here was that um, the lichtenbaum quillen conjecture at this stage, say that we, we, we see a bit more, so ra the rational see very, very little, but K-theory sees a wee bit more. And so uh, Alsani and Rognes start calculating, actually they calculate the K-theory of, well, K-theory of KU, topological K-theory, or rather the atom summand. And what they discover, and that's awesome. So, what happened was that when we calculated topological cyclic homology, when uh, Heslalt and Nelson calculated topological cyclic homology of the prime field, they found that that was a free module over the piadics. So going from P is equal to zero to P being a, a non-zero divisor. If you calculate the mod P uh, homotopy of topological cyclic of the piadics, well, there already P is a non-zero divisor, but the next periodic phenomenon going to the sphere spectrum is also not only a non-zero divisor, this thing here is a free module over the polynomial ring on that uh, element, the periodic element. And Alsan and Rognes show that this picture uh, actually transcends to the next layer where we have the next periodic uh, self map that acts uh, very, very nicely. Actually, it's a free V2 action up here. And so that spawns the redshift conjecture, um, which extends the Lichtenbaum Quillen conjecture, saying essentially that if you are here, that it, well, if you are here and you take K theory, then you are essentially here. That is, of course, a, a lie, but um, essentially what that's, that's going on. You climb the uh, chromatic tower by taking K theory. And um, yeah, so there are huge literature on that as well. Uh, of course, I couldn't resist having one of my students uh, here uh, with his paper that shows that this actually is the case to a large extent. Okay, but we did discuss um, localization a moment ago. And the question is now, how does that work uh, for ring spectra? And so for instance, you can have the localization from K theory, the uh, complex K theory, and this is the connected version, and this is the non-connected version. So this is a localization. And you also have the sort of residue field thought between KU and um, pi naught of KU, which is um, einbar maclean spectrum of the integers. And there are two papers that I want to highlight here. One uh, direction, uh, one is the log theory of uh, Rognes, Sagava, and Slichtkohl, 
And the other is the success story of Lumberg and Mendel, uh, who actually are able to prove a number of these localization sequences. Uh, again, using TC methods. I should say a lot about Galois theory, uh, but uh, suffices to say that this has been an, an, important, an important inspiration for finding examples of the Galois uh, theory for, for um, ring spectra. And also it shows a, a, a one can do very good calculations, not only of spherical group rings, but also of Tom spectra. And they have very, very good behavior. For instance, um, Siegel conjecture extends to some of these Tom spectra. So you can actually do this equivariant calculations, su substituting the actual fixed points with the homotopy fixed points. Okay. Still hang on. Overview. Okay. So there's one thing. So we, we talked about the smooth picture. We talked about uh, we talked about uh, schemes, smooth schemes. Guys in the uh, did a lot of things there. We talked about localization, but what about uh, closed excision? What happens when you take uh, when you, for instance, take um, B and C, B is red here and C is this curve here, they intersect in these two points and you glue them together and to get the pullback in rings or push out in schemes, um, A here, can you calculate A if you know the K theory of B, C and D? And there was actually a lot of development in the 80s in, uh, in this situation for the rational case. And you had the Kabi conjecture, um, which spawned quite a lot of calculations, assuming that the so-called Kabi conjecture was true. And, and it wasn't until 2006 that Cotinia proved that it actually is true. And I'll state it more precisely in a moment. And then, Immediately, Geister and Hesselot do it for TC, and then Kitang and myself do it for uh, TC of uh, connective ring spectra. And uh, the crowning achievement is put capped off on, by Lun and Tanner, who, well, beside this, do wonderful stuff on algebraic K theory here. So the thing is to look at the fiber of the K theory. Of uh, it, it fiber of the cyclotomic trace. And you have such a pullback diagram of uh, connected ring spectra. And you should assume that, uh, well, one of these, for instance, this one here is a surjection on pi naught. That's uh, so, yeah, you should assume that one of them is surjective, otherwise you'll have noise. Then the point is that the fiber of the cyclotomic trace actually is well satisfies meritorious in the sense that it takes these pullbacks to these pullbacks here. So you can calculate K theory or you can calculate the fiber of the cyclotomic trace by merely knowing the fiber of the cyclotomic trace for the three other uh, ingredients. And of course, that spawns calculations. So for instance, the first one is uh, Hessel's K theory of the coordinate axis, but it continues there on with very interesting uh, combinatorial problems that need to be solved in or order to uh, actually realize this program. Okay, so that is, so we have now, we have closed excision, we have also the smooth case, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, rigidity for nilpotent extensions. But the one thing we do not have until very, very recently is realizing the theory of Suslin and Gaber in algebraic K theory and Panin, I should mention. And so I actually applied for money in 86 to do this. I didn't get the money. And of course, that's why I didn't do it. Um, 
but now someone else has done it. Uh, and um, we have this wonderful, very recent paper by Klaus and Matthew and Morrow that take us all the way. So what does it say? So it extends the, the theory that we were discussing for um, between the prime field and the piatics, where the fiber of the sixth atomic trace actually is very nicely um, connects these two. And so what these fellows say is that, well, that had not anything to do with actually the piatics or anything like that. The only thing that is important is that on pi naught, the map is an, an Henselian uh, extension. And a Henselian, then if you've forgotten, it essentially just means that uh, Newton, Newton's method applies. But the, to me, the most important example is the complete situation. Uh, the only thing that is annoying about this thing here is that they need uh, their rings to be commutative. And there is no earthly reason why that should be necessary as far as I understand. But of course, that's how it went. That's how it was proven. That's how it is right now. Let's jump over structure on K theory. That's actually, we know very little of it. Um, one of the things that uh, became apparent to many people uh, after uh, Hill, Hopkins, and Ravenel uh, did the Kerberian variant was that there was something called the norm uh, and that topological cyclic homology probably had something to do with it. Uh, actually, some of us were doing much more naive things earlier on with the same conclusion. And uh, so, this is an important way of extending the theory to higher dimensions, at least when the input is commutative. So this is solely for commutative input. So here, instead of, well, the cyclic homology goes for the circle, this thing here goes for the n torus or for any other space x, and you have the action of whatever on that space x will be important for getting uh, what we here call the covering homology or cyclic homology if you have the torus or this the circle. Okay, I'll end, I'll end with uh, saying, getting you to two developments that were important for understanding, our understanding of K-theory. There are not calculations there. Uh, there are exactly um, frameworks. And the first one uh, I'll hold uh, Tabuado mostly responsible for. And, and that was that, well, from my perspective, what he said was that, well, this idea that K theory is the universal, uh, universal functor that functorially splits all short exact sequence. He gave that a, an actual mathematical framework. And ultimately, uh, in this paper here uh, by uh, Blumberg, Gettner, and Tabuada, they prove essentially, well, K-theory is initial among these functors that have this nice property. TC has this nice property. So there's exactly one cyclotomic trace. And that's of course important because uh, one of the things we were good at for a while were constructing new ways of giving the cyclotomic trace, but then we had the agony of showing that all the different ways of doing it were the same, but there is actually just one. So relax, do it, it construct it. And it is the one we want to. And it has all the nice property. It's multiplicative and whatever that we would, could ever dream of. So that was very, very, very nice to have settled there. And lastly, a uh, recent development in 2018, um, Nikolaus and Scholze um, reinterprets um, Masson's and Hesselhoff's theory for cyclotomic spectra so that, uh, so that TC is manifestly made out of only uh, homotopy invariant information. And so for instance, these fixed points, these actual fixed points that we were worrying about a moment ago, they are pulled back from 
uh, from, yeah, what is it? So you have THH and you have the THH uh, Tate construction, and then you have THH homotopy fixed points. And then these stupid fixed points, whether you know what they are or not, they're going to fit in the pullback square like this. So you don't really know what to know what they are. You only need to know this thing here. So essentially you only need to know this map here. And that map is the mysterious one. That is the cyclotomic structure. Very elegantly. So uh, from there on, um, some, of, some of the magic behind uh, topological cyclic homology vanishes uh, and it becomes easier to see what's going on. And it's time to stop. And sorry for being so speedy, but it's a huge theme, and I hope you can uh, I hope you can nest up some of the ideas if there is something that you're needing from here. I see him talking. Thank you, Bjorn. Actually,